Well, hello. <laughs> I'm a pathologist. DIY pathology. That's slightly scary, isn't it? <laughs> I don't attend crime scenes. I don't wear a white coat. Uh, and I certainly don't wear the four-inch killer heels that you see in Body of Proof. I couldn't balance on them for a start. No, I'm a clinical pathologist. And my interest is the living. Because pathology is the science behind the cure. And you have just had a fabulous expose of the sort of science that we need to take forward. So I work for the blood service. Um, but I'm afraid I like doing ordinary things in extraordinary places. And I, I work with all sorts of weird people. So I'm interested in blood at the scene of a road accident, blood on board the helicopter, blood on board a ship. But there's a common theme here, it's blood. Um, <laughs> interested in all the little things from vein to vein. Um, but I also get involved with the military. And that's a little bit controversial. So military medicine, particularly military pathology, has got sort of two main themes, blood and bugs. And at the moment, you can imagine Ebola, Sierra Leone, you know, there's a lot of work going on on how to really crack this crisis. But I've been asked to talk about war and transfusion for trauma, blood for the battlefield. Why? I mean, there's an obvious reason, you know, 1914, 2014, it's the sort of centenary at the start of one of the most awful wars in human history. War is a personal and community tragedy. But there's a paradox. War is an incredibly strong stimulus to innovation. It's a bit like Ebola. Why does it need a crisis to get us working together to actually take science through to a cure from the bench to the bedside. Why is the history of man punctuated by the problems of war? If we look at my own subject, we knew the science at the turn of the century. Landsteiner had sorted out the blood groups. We knew there were different ones. If you got the wrong blood into the wrong person, nasty reaction. But we didn't start applying it to the benefit of patients until certainly through the war where you know, we started with blood brothers, people being connected needle to needle, the patient and the donor being connected sort of in the beds next to one another. That's not much use to anyone. No, what we really needed to be able to do is to take the blood, keep it liquid, keep it sterile, and bank it so that it was ready for when there was an emergency when it was needed. And we get the same story time and time again. So after the war, great, Percy Oliver sets up the first blood bank in the UK, 1921. But really, it's then the Spanish Civil War that again sort of pushes people to actually provide a service that can deliver blood by mules to the front line. Bizarre. And then the Second World War again, we see a much larger engagement in society, taking blood to where it's really needed. And the same thing's happened again. In the last decade, there has been a revolution in military medicine. We have totally changed the paradigm of how care is delivered. From pre-hospital to hospital to rehabilitation, there has been a revolution in the continuity of care based on collaboration, cooperation instead of competition. Somehow, we've managed to join the dots to get the sort of survival um, that we never ever dreamt we could possibly do. And what I want to do is to explore just, just one of the small ideas which actually has been really big that has changed the way that we treat people in major trauma in the UK. And oh, here it is without its little red ring. So it starts, it's a very simple <coughs> statement, stop the bleeding, because the biggest threat on the battlefield, the immediate threat to life, is bleeding, bleeding to death. And the same thing applies to road traffic accidents, injuries anywhere. If you're so severely injured that you start to bleed and the bleeding can't be stopped, then actually you're at risk of dying. So what we need to do 
is to stop the bleeding. So whereas before we used to do ABC, airways, breathing, circulation, we now start with stop the bleeding, then we go on to the rest of the first aid. And first aid is an incredibly important thing for every part of society, and that's almost the first bit of DIY I'm going to mention today. So how have we been stopping the bleeding? Actually, we've almost been reinventing the past. We brought back tourniquets, dressings, Sounds a bit strange. Dressings with crushed up prawn that sort of stimulate the blood to clot. Bandages that apply a suitable pressure. And these really simple things can be applied by yourself, that's really DIY. Or buddy-buddy, where you help one another. You know how to save the life of the person next to you. And that's equally valid in the street as it is in a trench. But then there's a challenge. Having stopped the bleeding, if you leave that person for too long, the lack of the oxygen to the cells in the body then creates a condition called shock. And you've, you've just heard Ed mention how haemoglobin carries oxygen, vital to the cells. If we leave somebody in shock for too long, we've got another form of bleeding problem. The blood stops working. We've now got a totally different problem on our hands. And this is the other really very, very new thing we've had to learn about, is why do a third of trauma patients in the UK, when they come into hospital, why does their blood not work? Why do we need to stop the bleeding? And it's about trying to create a blood clot. And what we've learned is low blood pressure, low oxygen, creates a whole series of events where we stop the normal blood clotting. What we need to do is to understand how to build a blood clot. And I'm not a very good scientist, but I'm actually quite practical. So what we need to do is to help body do that natural burst of energy as the blood vessels attract the tiny, tiny fragments called platelets. The platelets themselves become activated. They attract one another. They start clumping together at the site of the injury, creating quite a, a friable clot. We then need to organise that because we need a really firm clot to hold that blood to stop the bleeding. So what happens next is the liquid blood then through a whole system, you've heard about proteins, there are sort of other things called enzymes. That cascade turns the liquid blood into a whole series of fibres. They're painted green in this picture. We need a strong fibrous network that embeds the platelets and the red cells to create a clot. And the way that we support this is by keeping the body warm and in addition providing extra things like calcium. So we know how to create a clot, but how do we then take that science and put it into practice so that the paramedic by the roadside can actually do something that's going to save your lives? Well, traditionally, what we'd do if somebody's blood pressure went low, we'd fill them full of salty water, saline, or perhaps salt water with sugar, dextrose saline. The problem there was not only were we potentially diluting the blood, diluting all these proteins, diluting the platelets that we need to make that clot, but also if you pushed it in too hard, pushed the blood pressure up, which they thought was a good thing, you might pop the clot. And so all this stop the bleeding business that you've just managed to achieve no longer worked. So what we've learned is the treatment for bleeding, the treatment of the loss of warm whole blood is strangely that. It is blood. That's where I come in. So, I know I was going to involve myself in the story somewhere. We need safe blood, and either we can use whole blood, because that's what I've just mentioned, or in this country, we use parts of blood. So you've heard mention the red cells carrying the oxygen, and we've got two bags of sort of yellow stuff, which are going to help build these clots. And the test tubes there are to show you that we need it to be safe, we need it to be tested, etc. And this has really worked, but my gosh, it's been a challenge. So somebody said to me a few years ago, Heidi, we want platelets out to the battlefield. And you say, well, guys, they need to be carried at 22 degrees centigrade. 
they need to be agitated, just stir it up a little bit. Oh, and they only last for five days. How are you going to do that? That's a mission impossible. But actually, through some really quite innovative work, working together with logisticians, material scientists, biomedical scientists, blood services, academia, all sorts of people, by working together, by collaboration, not competition, by thinking out of the box, doing the impossible, we've actually managed to do that. What we do is we get the blood to the right place at the right time, within the right time frames. That really takes teamwork because transfusion, like trauma, relies on teamwork. And we've heard a lot about teamwork already. But you know, reflecting on it over the last few weeks, I thought there was a member of the team that was often overlooked. And actually, they are the most important member of the team because it is the blood donor. And without the blood donor, we have absolutely nothing. And without those of you in this audience who are blood donors, who are platelet donors, we can do none of this. And that reminded me of a little project I did a few years ago. This is somewhere a few thousand miles away. That is a donor chair. And in this particular setup, they put their arm out to give blood, but it's an empty chair because there's no donor. And that was a tragedy. They had doctors, they had scientists, they had the kit we brought in, testing kit and plastic bag, but no donors, and that is a tragedy. Because the World Health Organization reckons that only 20 to 30% of health system have access to safe, sufficient blood. And the lack of blood is a tragedy because about a half a million women die every year due to lack of blood during childbirth. And so what we actually need is we need people to give blood because the history of man recognises the importance of blood. Folklore history recognises the rejuvenation through blood, but equally myths, misconceptions also show us that people are scared. They don't know that blood is constantly regenerated and that by giving blood, you yourself remain healthy. And a few years ago, there was this incredible book by a man called Richard Titmus. And he looked at blood donation systems in different parts of the world and volunteer blood. And he, he came up with this incredible quote in which he said that, you know, there's one thing that we all have in common that cuts across religious backgrounds, culture, ethnicity. And the one thing that we all have in common is this life stream of blood. And it is that life stream of blood that proves the reality of man. So I say to you, you might not be able to stop wars, but actually, you can do it yourself and perhaps make a difference to a stranger's life. Thank you.